Okay, Paul, you've had quite an adventurous last couple of years coaching in Pompeii and also so Micronesia for those uh, who are aware of that sort of area and also Mongolia. But let's go straight to the top. How did you end up in the Pacific coaching football? Um, largely through failing in this country. Uh, <laughs> that's right. what I would, that, that would be my advice to anyone who wants to do kind of uh, more explorational football missions is uh, if I'd been able to play in this country at high level, I would have just done that. But I was probably like millions and millions of other people who grew up wanting to be a footballer and just, just didn't make the grade. Um, so Lee I sort Catamol, of pretty much. <laughs> yeah, but, but still made it. It's quite depressing to think of Lee Catamol being about 100 times better than I ever was. Mm. Uh, but it's, it's true. I, I got to kind of semi-pro uh, level and then had this realisation, this terrifying realisation, far, far too late, about a decade, probably two decades later than I should have done, that it just wasn't going to happen for me. Um, and at that point, I was living with uh, a guy called Matt Conrad, who was my flatmate, uh, and we, we basically said, we're never going to play for England, the call isn't coming, why don't we go and find the world's lowest ranked international football team and play for them instead? And this is the kind of thing a lot of people have said in their lives, and usually Over they... Pine. Yeah, and usually people generally come up with a better idea for things to do with their lives or someone tells them not to be stupid or they sober up. But we came up with this idea completely sober, stuck to it, researched it and found the, the lowest ranked country was, was this island called Pompeii in Micronesia. I mean, not technically in the FIFA rankings, not technically even a country. It's one of four islands that make up a country the, of Micronesia. Um, and we contacted their FA and got an email back, which was a surprise that in the first place, uh, let alone from a guy who said, I've just moved to London, so I'm probably no use to you, but I'd, I'd love to meet you for a, for a drink. Um, ball started rolling. And the ball started rolling, especially when we spoke to him and he said, well, there's no point in trying to naturalise and play for this country. There's no one running football in, you know, on the islands at all, but there's a lot of kind of promising talent. They've just got no one to lead them. And at that point, the kind of light bulb moment happened. It helped that we didn't necessarily want to naturalise because we realised you'd have to learn the, the language of Pompeii, uh, which is fine. <laughs> I, I felt I could do that. Uh, secondly, we'd have to renounce British citizenship, and I, I wavered on that. I thought that's not completely that question. Uh, but we'd also have to marry a local woman uh, and live there for five years. And my, my girlfriend was having none, none of that, really, one. to be honest. So um, coaching took on a much better kind of outlook. So we, so, we, so we got there, um, so unbelievable achievement in itself, but what were, the, what were the biggest challenges there? I'm aware it's one of the wettest places on earth, so it's not exactly Old Trafford. So the, uh, no, the, the, the pitch was, there were more toads on the pitch than, in, uh, than footballers when we got there, and that's no exaggeration. It was a kind of a toad habitat that footballers had tried to claim, but um, they were losing the battle with the toads. Um, the pitch was always flooded, and there were very few people actually playing regularly at the time we arrived. Um, so, you know, very quickly it became obvious that there was a reason why this was the lowest ranked country. Um, we also had found out it, was, it had the highest obesity rate pretty much in the world as well. So it, it dawned fairly quickly that this wasn't going to be a kind of uh, two or three month jolly. It was going to be quite a long process of trying to, to build something. OK, well, we are going to show a clip in uh, just one minute's time, a, tr a trailer of a documentary. So mm. tell us a little bit about that. Were you sort of aware as, as you were there, you were like, actually, we could make a fantastic film here? Well, funnily enough, Matt, uh, Matt, the guy that I went with, who was also coaching, was, uh, had always wanted to make films. And so he, this mission came partly for him as a documentary idea. For me, I just always wanted to be in football. Um, and so he was pointing cameras at me the whole time, and I was telling him to stop pointing cameras at me the whole <laughs> time. Uh, so most of what came about was this documentary, you know, it was, it was basically two years of, of this mission from going from this pitch with just toads on it and no one really playing to playing and trying to win their first ever match. Um, and most of that is me just telling him to stop pointing a camera at me. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll put that to the test. We're now going to play the trailer for The Soccer Man. It's one of the wettest places on earth with a population that would only fill half of Wembley Stadium. But the tiny Pacific island of Pompeii is where two friends are hoping to create an international football team. Paul Watson and Matt Conrad have set themselves the challenge. What happened was we were researching the most remote footballing nations in the world. We found Pompeii, which is you know, the only international team in the world, never to won a game. We kind of, against all the odds, decided to travel across the world to do it. First training session. Yeah. On our way. 
just looking forward to it. Yeah. I think it'll be a lot of people. This is not the, quite the turnout we thought, but... Technically, it is one man, but I think he has an English shirt on. That's not really regulation. Unfortunately, they really don't have any leader. Do you think people even care about soccer here? Yeah, they care. A few do. We went to see the sports minister, lieutenant governor. And soccer right. He's not really playing. I think because of the lack of organisation, yeah. nobody really takes the sport and develop it. It's kind of sucks we have to give people's blessing. Oh, I know yeah. you have to. I know what you mean. It does feel weird getting his blessing to do what we basically already started doing and yeah, so many helping them. Like, yeah, and what people don't seem to give a about anyway. Yeah. Within a week of being here, we're the most powerful man in the sport of football. They put the goals up for us. Put them up, put them up. That's progress. I think the English thing carries a lot of cachet. We knew Dilshan had been playing an important role. What we didn't realise was that he brought this weird ragbag assortment of like gawkers who were there to see foreigners, people who wanted to steal our equipment. This is one rousing anthem. And with the underdogs, some of whom have played football this many times. I ate too much. Because they have real potential now. Come on, boys! You're sexy! Hey, Tui, how did the game go for you? Oh, wow. That was a tough one. Yeah! Already we're outsiders, so it makes our job harder. His pelvis is broken. He's like abdomen and his organs. The process of taking 16 athletes from this island to Guam stimulates the future growth of the sport. The reason they feel like this is because this to them is a World Cup. We have one work tonight. It's a World Cup times 10 because they may never come back here. Do you have a message for people back home in Pompeii? I want to make my country proud. So we're going to come back out here tomorrow with a determination, and we're going to win. Quick, quick, quick! If we win tomorrow, this is going to change everything. No, we absolutely loved it, don't we? It comes <laughs> AFR in Dorstpool, and we will be going to see it, but when can we see it exactly? Uh, it should be next spring. Um, it should be released next spring. And it's, um, yeah, I mean, I hope, I hope people uh, do go and watch it. It's sort of the story of what, what happens when you are the worst of the worst and you, um, and you try and get off the bottom, basically. We should reference as a book. Yeah, well. uh, there is a book. I wrote a book uh, called Up Pompeii. Uh, the pun is not my fault. The pun was part of the book deal. In multiple languages now as well. Was it Turkish recently? You say multiple, it's in two, which I guess is multiple. Oh, okay. it's, in, <laughs> it's in English and Turkish, so it's in all the hey. big markets, you know, the other languages. We haven't done the smaller languages like French and German. You know, the ball's rolling on that. So Do French want... people read? I don't know. Yeah, yeah we'll see. Um, but yeah, if you want to find out the full extent of that adventure, then obviously go and watch the film or read the book. Um, but then you had, uh, you didn't really rest up for too long, you had yet another unbelievable adventure going to Mongolia. Yeah, well it kind of came from this actually, that um, someone contacted uh, Matt initially and said, um, I want you to come to Mongolia and coach a team there. <laughs> well, obviously. Um, yeah, it, I, I suppose it didn't go in the junk mail actually, but for quite a while we, we um, denied over whether we should do it. But actually the project was, seemed like a really worthy project. The idea was that Mongolia was setting up its own breakaway league because the official federation league is in disrepair so this this new organization had set up a league called the mongolian premier league and it had already built up more players and more teams than the official league which got gets all the fifa funding uh, and they wanted me to come in and build a kind of flagship professional team uh, and that was then hooked up to a reality tv show so we were sort of doing the X Factor of Mongolian Whoa, football. Whoa, the dream combo. It, it, it's what I always knew I wanted to do. Can we, oh, I'd love to see that. We, there was a Somewhere. trailer, but again, I mean, like most of my time in Mongolia, I didn't understand a word of the trailer. <laughs> um, You're a superstar over there. No, <laughs> not even the superstar in Mongolia, sadly. It's, um, it's, it was a very odd experience, so that's, that's all I can was say. Was it challenging? Because we haven't really spoken about the coaching side of it. Mm. I mean, you, hadn't, you weren't exactly a professional coach when you got no. involved in these escapades. Um, but was it a real step up in, in Mongolia compared to Pompeii? Yeah, the, the level is much, much higher. Uh, and what was really interesting and, and quite telling was that when we started doing these triads, these kind of uh, auditions, um, we found that people turning up to the auditions ranged from people that had come from kind of tiny villages in the desert 
uh, nomadic, basically nomadic families who, who come in because they'd seen it on TV, all the way through to players in their current national team. So you had this very odd situation where people who are playing for the teams that are supposedly the best in the country were coming to our auditions to audition for a team in a league that isn't official. And yet anyone joining our team knew that by doing so they wouldn't be allowed to play for their national team because the national team is, is affiliated to this other league, this FIFA league. Ah. And so it was a very, very odd situation. It showed how something was rotten at the core of football in Mongolia. And our, our whole notion was to kind of show, give kids a generation of Mongolian footballers that they'd seen on TV that they could aspire to be. Because generally you get thousands of people going and watching Premier League football in Mongolia on these kind of dodgy online feeds in bars with Mongolian kind of MCs commentating over the top of it. And it, it's crazy atmosphere, it's fantastic. People love Liverpool and Manchester United, but they just see Mongolians as not being good at football. They, it's they, a similar vibe to the Indian Super exactly, League. Exactly, and that's yeah. why I really hope that the Indian Super League does the same thing for, for Indian footballers, young Indian footballers, as we were trying to do for Mongolian footballers, to say, you know, it's not, it, I can see why you think you can't be Wayne Rooney, but we're gonna give you a generation of people who, who you can look at and say, well, I could be that person. Because I think it's very hard to aspire to be someone if you can't really understand how they've, they've grown up and what their, what their existence has been like. And people over there looked at people like Wayne Rooney as if they were a different species. They couldn't, they loved them and idolised them, but they couldn't imagine f being them. And sort, of, sort of a separate entity sort of thing, a completely different yeah. world that they're not a part of. And that was something horribly, something horrible about that, that idea that you can't be something if you want to be it. And also like the essence of football, just to be a purist, is to go to live games, is to feel that atmosphere, to, you know, to smell the grass. Yeah, and nobody does. Um, in Mongolia, you, nobody does. The, the league champions, that connection. yeah, Erchim, the league champions, play their games in almost secrecy. You don't really know when they're on, you don't know what the results are, but you know they've won. And this is a terrible, you know, I, I presumed I'd show up and there'd be people walking around with Urchim shirts on, but they're just affiliated with a power plant. They're called Urchim Nuclear Power Plant 3 or something. Thermo Power Plant 3, you know. This isn't, Ooh. there's no one to buy into and say, you know, th these are our boys and we're going to go out and support them. And yet there are thousands of football fans and that, that's where that, there's that massive disconnect. And that's what the side that we set up were called Bayangol. And it's a region of the, the city. And the idea was just to kind of say, here's a team you can actually support and here, here, here are their stories on TV and you can see they're just like you. Um, and yeah, a lot of them were just these really kind of young kids that none of them ever thought they would actually be professional footballers because you just grow up thinking it's impossible in Mongolia.